live stream. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 9 Eastern. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dansfish.com, and I'm glad to have you here. Just checking my volume. Looks like we're good. Okay. Awesome. Glad I could make it. Uh, <laughs> it's been one of those days. And I was trying to, I was like, I've got to finish feeding the fish before the live stream. I've just got to. So I was like, the last few tanks, I was just like, ah, throwing food in. But I made it. I did. I made it. Okay. So we have a cool giveaway tonight. We'll be giving away a classic, some lemon tetras. And in just a few minutes, we'll talk about that. And I'll tell you how to enter. Ten guesses what the hashtag will be to enter pretty easy but before we do that then I want to um, do the shipment report and let you know, guys know how everything has gone shipping the fish and kind of report in with you guys so I do this every week for those that are new uh, I ship fish for a living and every week I tell you if there were any losses if there were any problems uh, kind of just give you a report I do this because it keeps me very engaged with the shipping and if I have to report to you every week how things are going, then I'm not going to be cutting any corners. It keeps me honest. <laughs> Anytime I might think, oh, I could just do it the easy way this week, knowing that I have to come here and tell you guys if something went wrong, keeps me doing it right. I mean, I would do it right anyway, I like to think, but it's, it's just an added incentive. Um, all right, so with that, the shipping report is pretty good since I last talked to you as far as everyone's reported to me there haven't been any losses so everything we've shipped has arrived alive and seems to be doing well so that's awesome especially since it's uh, this cold so to be able to do that when it's nice and cold is good um, I also got some different heat packs I I hate this about heat packs this happens every now and then so I ordered a whole case of heat packs and these were the, I have two sizes, one is 72 hours and the other one's like 40 hours or 42 hours, something like that. Um, and I was excited because I got some 40 hours that had an adhesive on the back. So I was thinking, great, I'll be able to stick them up on the styrofoam and that'll make it a lot easier. I didn't even know I had ordered those, I just ordered some and uh, they happened to have adhesive on the back. So I was all excited. But I've have, been having some issues with those for like every 10 that I put out only like two or three actually heat and so I got a little nervous about that as it got colder and colder and a few weeks ago I got a, a different case of 40 hour heat packs from a, a different supplier and all of those are toasty and nice and warm like within a few minutes of being activated so I think that's helping make a difference as we get colder that the heat packs are getting better so uh, it's always a bummer when you get a dud and it's like the whole case so I don't know what happened I is it like a 10 year old case like those things last forever if they're sealed so I'm not sure but that's one of the hazards of being a fishmonger I suppose so anyway things seem to be going well um, I got several emails from customers today and everything seemed to be doing fine as of mid-afternoon when I last checked and I'll get back to those folks uh, tomorrow. Today's been crazy busy, so I just glanced to make sure there were no problems and moved on with my day. I had uh, lots of fish to ship out today, and with the new import, I, I've had to do all the medicating and, and TLC to get everyone healthy and happy, get everyone fed. When they first come in, it can be a little tricky to transition them to prepared food, so uh, it's, it takes me longer to feed a fresh import than it would, you know, a well acclimated, settled in kind of fish. So it's been that kind of a day, but I made it. Let's do this. So let's get to the giveaway. The giveaway tonight is for some lemon tetras, a classic in the hobby, beautiful, hardy, um, aptly named. <laughs> so if you'd like to win those, I will send the winner of tonight's giveaway six of those fish. And to enter, all you have to do is put hashtag lemon in the chat, L-E-M-O-N, hashtag lemon. So if you want to enter and perhaps win six lemon tetras, and they're nice size. I've had them for a little while. So they're good. Uh, they aren't little tiny ones. They have some good color. They're good size. And... Uh, 
basically I was walking around the fish room today saying what would be the thing to give away so what I do is I just walk around and I'm like what looks really good today and there were a couple of them sparring and displaying and so I was like yeah those <laughs> so not the rarest fish or anything but one that I think will go well in almost any aquarium with with small community fish so all right hashtag lemon to enter and man folks are entering that's a lot of lemons in the hashtag. <laughs> so um, let me tell you about the import just a little bit, and then we'll get to your questions and comments. So I did get the import. There was a problem with it due to you know the COVID situation and the lack of flights and everything. Um, they were sent by a different airline this time, and they had a whole day's delay. So they were quite delayed, and that's not good when you're doing an import. And so some of them came in really rough. The ones I'm most worried about right now are I, I got some uh, King Tiger Plecos and they came in and some of them had red streaks on their bellies. And I'm treating them. We seem to be recovering, but they aren't eating yet. It's touch and go, I've lost some. And so I'm, I'm worried about those quite a bit. Um, and there's a couple others that are, are touch and go right now. But even with the uh, delay, um, almost everything came in well. Rougher than normal, but well enough that as of today, almost everything is settled in and started eating and, and starting a couple days ago really started to settle and, and look like, okay, they're confident in their tank now, um, they're out and about, they're actively looking for food, and they ate like pigs today, almost everything. So it's going pretty well on that end. So I'm excited about that, I'm happy about that, um, because it was a rough start to that import. Got a whole bunch of Chilotherinia, <laughs> I always do Inia, Chilotherinia Blairi in, because I keep selling out of those every time I bring them in, and folks, keep asking me when are you getting more so I do have a lot more uh, nice size group they're smaller they came in at about two inches right about two inches this time instead of the three inches from before which is nice because it means they were able to send me a lot more in the box than they could have with the big ones um, and then the fish that I'm absolutely in love with was a suggestion from someone in um, this chat a few weeks ago asked if I could get these and I looked into them and I was able to bring some in so I did get in some Stiffidon Annie which I am super excited about and they are so pretty the least colorful one looks this good um, this is fully fired and a couple of them the more dominant ones a couple of them are looking something like that here's another picture of them oh wait that might be something else sorry not a whole lot of pictures of them i guess oh here we go i'm not quite sure if that's the same species but that looks pretty similar um but anyway those and some other neat gobies that came in are what keep drawing my eye whenever i go out to the to the fish room and um or to the annex where i'm keeping them and, and just look around invariably I find myself like staring at them and I have to remind myself hey you got work to do <laughs> I have to force myself away from the tank and, and down the aisle to finish my work but um, got those and several other goby types that I'm very excited about they're doing very well and um, if I, if I could remember the names of all of them, I'd share them with you right now, but a lot of these, they are first for me, and so I can't remember exactly what the scientific name is, because <laughs> Latin and me, but yeah. So thanks again to the person that um, asked if I could get those, which kind of gave me the boost I needed to, to bring in some of the more expensive gobies. I, I tend to shy away when things are pricey, and these are pricey. And um, I know people are gonna ask, what, how pricey? And I can't, I don't know yet, but, um, but they're doing well, which is exciting. They ate like little pigs today, got fat little bellies, they're, they're doing well. So anyway, 
that's what's going on in my world. Uh, we're still working on building the fish warehouse. Lots of progress. Engineering plans keep coming in um, and heading to the contractor. So it's, man, this is a process. <laughs> when I first started this, I was just going to build like a pole barn out in the country, basically. And my brother Jonathan has a big tractor. We're like, okay, we'll bring that up. We'll level everything off. We'll pour a slab, put up a simple building, and it won't be a problem. And what happens when th things change, and now we're building a warehouse in town instead of out in the country, is it's a whole different process. There's a whole bunch of engineering requirements. There's a whole bunch of licensing requirements and permitting requirements that you don't have if you build outside the city. Um, so I am learning that process and we're moving along. Uh, we are this, the contractors kind of first in line as soon as the spring thaw hits, we'll be ready to go. Um, and, and, it, and stuff is moving, but man, it's like, we're doing so much and I'm like, but I can't see the building yet. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> but it's coming. I, I've got a video of, of the creek slash river um, in the tests I'm running on it and all that that I'll be uh, releasing as soon as I can find a moment just to post it basically. But it's coming along and things look good and I can't wait for that to happen. So that's what's going on in my world. Let's get to your world. I'm going to scroll up and start getting to your questions and comments. If you have questions about aquarium fish, um, how to build a fish room, how to breed fish, how to ship fish, that kind of stuff, fish hobby stuff, then ask away. If you would make the hashtag or the comment, not hashtag, I'm sorry, if you would in your comment make it at dance fish, so type the at symbol and dance fish, then select dance fish when it pops up, then it'll highlight for me and I'll be able to get to it expeditiously. So with that, I forgot my water, just a sec. It's right over here. All right, I'm not gonna make it through a live stream without something to wet my whistle. Okay, so let's get to questions and comments. The first one I can see because Jat, chat, Jat, I was trying to say chat jumps and it came out Jat, hashtag Jat, um, because chat, jumped on me um, is punchy paints don't be giving me away a dance fish I look really good today all right we're gonna do two giveaways today one is for lemon tetras the other is for Pam from punchy paints <laughs> stuff her in a box and mail her to you <laughs> hope you're doing well Pam it's great to hear from you black hill stj hashtag lemon tetra thanks for the opportunity as always hey you're welcome those are super underrated fish if you ask me hashtag breeding is pleasure boom boom in the fish room and three times equals world peace so this must be michael wentworth must have changed his username to black hills tj hey michael hope you're doing well Wherever you're at in the world right now, hope you're doing well. Alexandria Rodriguez, the weather change has got my fish going crazy. Four different sets of fry from four different fish. That's cool. I'm glad to hear it. Yes, uh, low pressure systems, little cooling temperature that can make fish think, hey, the rainy season is coming, game time, and they go for it. So I'm glad to hear that. That's always fun behavior to watch. Um, you know, even if the eggs don't hatch or the babies don't raise up, just the display and the spawning behavior and all that, it's just, it's so cool to watch. It's just one of the most beautiful sights in the world, I think, when they dance and display and try to attract each other. <laughs> Rico Stan, weird, Dan doesn't sound like an old man, must have just been your stream. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad the audio is working, that's all I can say, because sometimes it don't. And that ain't no fun. Pugamus is here. Hey, Pugamus, good to see you. Blake Adams, do you feed while you're medicating new fish? I feel like a lot of back and forth on that on the internet. Watch your med video today from three years ago. Great info. Okay. So, yes and no. 
anytime I'm using antibiotics, anytime they're in a quarantine tank and I'm using antibiotics, I generally do not feed. And the reason for that is if I'm using antibiotics, they will kill the bacteria, the nitrifying bacteria. So I can't have any filtration in the tank and I don't want ammonia in the tank. So in my experience, ammonia is much more deadly to fish than going without food for a little while. So generally, if they're in a hospital tank, I don't feed until they get through the antibiotic regime. Okay. Now that is not always the case. Sometimes fish will come in and they obviously need food more than medicine or they need both. Like sometimes they come in and the bellies are so pinched and they're so malnourished that you can see it. And in those cases, I do put a priority on food. Hopefully in a case like that, where the fish need some nutrition right away, I have a tank not in the hospital tank system that is empty and has a mature filter in it where I can put them and feed them right away. And what I feed them in those cases tends to be baby brine shrimp because it's small and alive and highly nutritious or black worm, some kind of live food because I don't want any decay in there and I want something that they'll key onto and eat right away even if they're really stressed and really weak from hunger. So sometimes a fish is so in, in such dire straits that it needs food more than medicine and then I'll try to do that. Um, if a fish needs food and antibiotics all at once, that's a tough call. Sometimes I'll just put them in a hospital tank and medicate. Sometimes I'll put them in a hospital tank and I will feed and just make sure I'm, that they're eating everything and I'll only feed live food and I'll siphon the bottom very frequently so any fish poop doesn't decay in there. But that's tricky. When you do that, you have to change a lot of water and you have to do it frequently because the ammonia in there can pop really, really fast. So in most cases though, let's say I'm getting fish in, they're not in dire straits, um, they go in the quarantine tank system, then I don't feed until they come out of that. So kind of depends on the situation. Um, and it depends on the medicine. If you're not using a gram-negative bacteria, or, or uh, an antibiotic that kills gram-negative bacteria, I should say, um, and you're just able to keep them in a tank that's fully cycled and everything, why not feed them? That can't hurt. Now, I wouldn't feed a ton. I would just feed a little bit because new fish might not eat right away. But if they will eat right away, then why not give them some nutrition? Um, and this is one of the things when, that, uh, that was clarified for me when I went, to, when I attended the um, Aquarium Veterinarian Conference. They specifically talked about when you get new fish in, get them good nutrition right away. So if you can, then it can't hurt. Helps them recover. Peeps lost sheep. Will you do a video on the fish you got in? That's the plan. Um, I can't promise it, but that's the plan. So where I'm at right now is that uh, basically the reason to post videos and pictures on a store like mine is to sell fish, right? I'm selling so many fish right now that I'm so busy doing that that it doesn't take time, it doesn't make sense to take time to take pictures and make videos. So when that equation balances out again, and I'm not just, all my time isn't tied up with just packing fish and selling them, because it will, if I don't post pictures and videos, sales will gradually diminish. Then I'll have the time to go ahead and post more videos and pictures. So right now I'm just, it's this equilibrium thing. Sometimes I have tons of sales, so I can't take pictures and videos. I just don't have time. And sometimes sales drop and then it's like, oh, now I can take pictures and videos, which boosts sales. So it's this thing going on. And that's just because I'm here alone and there's only so much I can handle. I've got to care for all the fish. I've got to uh, arrange for imports and everything. Um, and I'm on a big construction project right now, which takes a lot of time. So 
it's just a really busy time and there's just one of me. Once... So it's weird. It's like, well, why, why wouldn't you do that and get more sales? It's like I literally can't pack more. I, I, I literally can't handle the volume. So um, like there's been a couple times this year where uh, shipments have been three weeks behind. Like someone orders fish and I'll email them and say, thanks for the order. I'll be shipping them on this date. And it's like three weeks in advance. And I don't want to do something which will get me perpetually into that zone right now because I don't think that's a good customer experience. So I'm not really concerned about ramping up sales right now, which sounds weird, I know, but I don't want I don't want new customers to come and then have that bad experience and be like, I'm not gonna order from here again. It takes like three weeks just to send the fish. What's with that, right? Now, that's why I'm building the warehouse though, is because demand and everything has got so much that I can no longer handle it on my own. So with the warehouse up, we're gonna start with four of us there instead of just me, right? And that'll help. And then the nice thing about the warehouse is it has the room and the infrastructure that as sales increase, we can bring on more help. So we shouldn't get in that situation where it's like, sales are so high that we can't take pictures and videos and, and stuff like that. So, but right now it's tricky because it's just me on my own property doing it. I don't want to not get sales. I need them. And I, I'd really like to close the year out strong. So if you're thinking of ordering, please do. But um, I also don't want to create a bad customer experience. So as soon as I can get out of the house, though, yeah. W. Marion, come on, share the list, the import list. Um, I, I would, I normally do, but I, I don't actually have it in a format I can share right now. So I, I can't. I have the, the hard copy, um, but I don't have a list that is in the computer that I can bring up and share. So um, I'm sorry, that's going to have to wait till next time. Rich Lidstrom. Hi, Dan. How do you handle maintenance like siphoning tank bottoms with a fish room? Do you worry about cross-contamination with a siphon or do you sanitize it after every tank? Well, that is a very, very good question. So did I say Rick? I, I think it's Rich. Sorry if I said Rick earlier. So Rich um, totally depends on the situation. So if I'm a hobbyist and I have my tanks going, then I'll have a quarantine area, right? That has its own siphon tubes and everything. But once they come out of quarantine, I'll have another section of tanks, which has already been through quarantine and that'll have its own siphon. So I'd have two siphons in that case, one for the quarantine section and one for um, the normal section. Or it's probably just one single quarantine tank is what I'm envisioning. So um, that way, once a fish gets out of quarantine, then the risk is highly diminished. It has in a thing, and I would just use one and go back and forth. Is that perfect? No. Could there be an issue? Yes. But once fish are through quarantine, then we, we just say, okay, worth the risk. The risk is pretty low now. That's how I think it, it makes sense for the average person keeping fish at home. For me, though, how I handle it here is... I really don't hardly siphon the bottom of my tanks. What I do instead is I have a sponge filter and a, a box filter to collect debris. A third to like 33 to 40 percent of the water is automatically changed every day and can overflow. So a lot of the debris in the water just flows out of the tank during the automatic water changes. And then I have a bushy nose pleco in each aquarium and they keep the bottom clean. They stir it up as they browse around, they scrape off any algae and stuff growing on it, and as they do that, they whip it up into the water column where it either flows out of the tank during water exchange or gets sucked up by the filters. Um, so I hardly actually ever find that I have much in the way of detritus on the bottom of a tank that I need to siphon. If I keep a bushy nose 
pleco in each aquarium. Or there's other fish that can, uh, schools of quarries help kick it up too. There's certain fish that just do a good job and plecos are great because they don't just kick it up, but they, they scrape off gunge from the bottom as well. So that's how I handle that so that I don't have to constantly be taking a siphon hose and transferring it from tank to tank to tank. But occasionally there will be some gunk that builds up on the bottom and I do have to siphon, in which case, as long as the fish are out of quarantine and they've been what, doing fine for a long time, I'll use the same hose. I don't have a separate hose for every aquarium. Now that would be a level up, but that's also a huge pain in the rear end. <laughs> so, so that's how I handle it. I'm not saying that that's the perfect way, the most biosecure way to do it, but it's worked for me for a lot of years and um, it's been successful for me and for my customers that get my fish. So that's how I that's how I handle it. Okay, hang on, chat jumped. So I am a looking here for the next one. Okay, there it was. There was riches. Wait, mile high is here. Hey, if that's mile high plecos, hey Mikey Trevor. If you're someone else, hello. <laughs> Leland Wright with low light. Can I? What can I use to carpet my 75 gallon tank? If someone here could answer that question for Leland, that would be great. Leland, I'm not a plant guy. So I'm gonna, there are a lot of really knowledgeable plant people though in this chat. So if you guys could answer Leland and, and make your comment at Leland, so uh, Leland sees it easily, that would be great. So sorry, I'm not the guy to help you. I can, I keep water sprite and Java moss and a few other things, but. It, stuff I can't kill. <laughs> S, okay. Shrestla. Shrestla. S. Shrestla, I think. Picked this catfish as a bottom cleanup fish recommended by Pet Smart Guy for my cichlids. Okay, that's better. 75 gallon tank. What are your thoughts? Should I? At first, I was concerned because <laughs> I pictured this peaceful little community tank with a Pictus catfish in it. But with your cichlids, depending on the kind of cichlid and the size and stuff, then yes, I think Pictus catfish, if everyone's of the right size, could be a great companion for that tank to help clean it up. Or you could do the natural thing and get some Cynodonis catfish. If you're unfamiliar with those, let me show you a few. So this is this is how you spell that, Cynodontis. Let's see if we can get a, there you go. Okay, so you can do some more research on your own. These, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, and when you say cichlids, by the way, I'm imagining African cichlids for some reason. Um, if you have an African cichlid tank, then these Cynodonis, a lot of these species naturally live with African cichlids in the wild. And so they might be a great option for you. Now, if you're talking about, I guess I should qualify this. When you say in your cichlid tank, cichlid is a massive family of fish, um, cichlidae, and there are many species. Some are tiny and peaceful and would get beat up by a Pictus catfish. Some are super large and aggressive and would eat a Pictus catfish. But if you're talking about like a mid-size African cichlid, then I think it would work just fine. Michael Meliere, do you have any experience with canister filters? Thoughts? Yes, I do. Um, I run on this 125, I run a Fluval FX5. That's how old it is. It's been going for... I've had that thing run in on various aquariums for 15 years now and it's still going. The only thing I've ever had to replace on it is occasionally the little rubber gaskets will crack because they're rubber. And I've had to replace those once. I think that was like three years ago. So in my experience, I know a lot of people don't like canister filters. But I've had great experience with them. I love the Fluval line. I never tried Elite. I have tried some others, but the Fluval is the one that has lasted a long time. Um, and I really like them. So I don't think there's anything wrong with canister filters. And I don't think they're that hard to clean. I mean, you, you turn the valve so that the water doesn't come out of the hoses. You pull off the top or you detach the hoses and then you have access. I, 
I don't understand people that are like, <laughs> if you get one, you'll never clean it. To me, it's not hard to clean at all. So I actually really like them. If you do use a canister filter, it's much more effective to have some kind of pre-filter. I know Aquarium Co-op sells the pre-filter sponges. Those really do work and help keep the canister filter going longer so it doesn't get so gunked up as quickly and also keep stuff from getting sucked in there that you don't want getting sucked in there like you know snails and fish stuff like that but in this tank what it is is there's this massive i don't know if you can see them but um this this corner has this big weir in it and it's just stuffed full of filter floss and every couple years i'll open up the canister filter to see if i need to do anything with it and I never do because the filter floss takes out so much detritus and stuff that by the time the water gets to the canister filter there's hardly anything in it as far as gunk goes and it's just more biological filtration at that point so it runs very efficiently on that system so I really like them now I will say I have had a bad experience I, I, I guess I should say and that was from I think it was the, the brand was Cascade I think we got it at Petco I had a friend that was setting up a 55 gallon in his um, house and um, <laughs> I don't know why that's important in his boudoir <laughs> no, in his living room and um, the only canister filter we could find in town was the one at Petco I think it was called the Cascade that thing just leaked all the time that that was a problem but the fluvals have been good for me Alex Repco, or is it Repco? That'd be Repco. Shipping fish in breather bags, pros and cons. So, pros are you can ship more fish in less volume. Since you don't have to have room for air in the bag, let's say I'm shipping in a, a standard traditional plastic bag that's not a breather bag. I would have about a quarter to a third of that water and the rest air, right? So, 75 to two-thirds of it is wasted space that you just have to have air in. All that goes away with the breather bag. So you can ship a lot more fish in a much more compact area. That's the advantage. The other advantage is it doesn't slosh around as much. Since the bag is totally full of water, you don't get that wave action as much. So maybe it's a little steadier in there for the fish. Now, fish generally can handle a little sloshing. <laughs> they they know how to swim really well. But um, those, I believe, are the two pros. My experience, everything else is con. I find them flimsy and hard to work with. When you're trying to seal them correctly, that can be a pain. Um, but I, I, I used them for years. Here's the thing, though, that makes breather bags unacceptable for shipping fish is that UPS, USPS, and FedEx, I don't know about DHL, but who ships fish DHL? The three main carriers all have a policy for shipping live fish and you should read it. You should know what their policy is if you're using their service. The policy states that there has to be redundancy. They all have to be double bagged. And here's where you get the big problem. I have never found a way to double bag breather bags that works. I've tried all the ways. The manufacturer says there's a way to do it. If you look online, they'll say here's the way you do it. I, I've never got it to work. So because I can't double bag breather bags and all the carriers require fish bags to be double bagged, I don't see how we can use them. Now, a lot of people don't double bag them <laughs> and uh, just are not shipping according to the carrier's policy. But I look at the carriers as my partners in business. Um, I want them to be happy and I want them to make me happy. And so I do everything I can to make sure that they're happy with what I'm doing. And if you don't double bag and there's a leak, that's a problem, man. It doesn't just destroy your shipment it it gets all the packages around the thing you're sending all wet too and it can destroy a lot of stuff it can be very damaging to their business so I don't know when I, I when I got clear with FedEx I, I literally had to ship them a box 
as a sample saying, here's how I ship fish. And I literally sent them a box, no fish in it, but everything else. And they had to open it and check it and make sure that everything was done so I could get certified as a, as a shipper of live fish for FedEx. So that's my thoughts on that. I know a lot of people that do ship with breather bags, but they are violating the policy of the carrier with which they're shipping. Now, that being said, if you're just driving your own car and you're going to the Killifish convention and you wanna bring some fish there and you're not like shipping them via UPS, FedEx or USPS, sure, that's great. You can fit a ton of fish in a suitcase that way. Um, no problem. But as far as actually shipping them, there's no way I know to do that and be, um, and be compliant. Orange cones, if you have forgotten your water, <laughs> you've lost your mind. You are a fishmonger. That's right. What's a fishmonger without water? Cheers. <laughs> All right, everyone. Holly Gibbs and Fishy Mon 64 and Mismatched Socks and Leland. I'll get in your comments deleted. Are you misbehaving? If you are, don't. Don't make life hard on my mods. Skipper's Aquariums at mile high. Ask how can I make shipping fish possible? What do I need? Um, I would just tell you to please watch my video on shipping fish. If one of my mods could link that if they haven't already, I go over it in detail. Um, I give a presentation to aquarium clubs about how to ship fish and things like that. So if you're a member of a local aquarium club and you want a ton of details on that and uh, you know me and your club just answering all the questions your club might have about that in detail, I'd be happy to do that presentation for them. But I would say Mile High, if you would start by um, just watching the video that I've made on that subject and then let me know if you have any questions as a follow-up. Xanadoo do. Looking at your Fun of the Pantrax Gardener, right? how many for a 40 gallon breeder? Oh, geez, a ton. You could fit so many in a 40 gallon breeder. Um, long term, though, looks good. Display, not crowded looking. I don't know. 20 to 30, I think. You know, it depends on the tank setup. Is it planted? Does it have lots of line of sight blocks? Is it just a bare tank with a sponge filter in one corner and nothing else? You know, I don't, I don't know all those details, but I'm picturing like a standard tank set up for a display in a living room or something. Um, probably has some plants or plastic plants and a castle or something, right? Um, I don't know, 20 to 30 is a start, I would say. They're not a demanding fish. They, and they, they aren't a strong swimmer or anything that needs tons of space. So you can get quite a few of them in a tank. Charlie Jackson, do you have any native live bears? Do I actually is a good question. I don't, I have a wild type sword tail right now. The copper sword tail. What is it Kalmani? Is that how you, the one? But that's all I have right now. Um, and, and they're not native. So I do not. I would refer you to Select Aquatics, selectaquatics.com, if you're looking for um, neat live bears. Greg Sage has them. I've been to his house. I've seen his setup. I've talked to the dude. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, loves live bears. Loves the hobby. Works really hard to preserve different live bears. And if he doesn't have them, he'll know someone that does. So, yep. W. Marion, the Matano rice fish have arrived well. Oh, good. 74 degrees or warmer in the box. Arrived at 3.40 in the afternoon. That's great. I am glad to hear it, W. Marion. Thanks so much for letting me know. Um, did they have... I don't know if you saw Fish Boy's video, but I sent him a batch. And they had some... I don't know. We don't know what it was. Uh, some issues, like a little fungus on the tail, a little white on the body, stuff like that. It did clear up in a few days, but um, did you have any of that or did they come in okay? I, I, since Fish Boy, since I, Fish Boy had that issue, I did try to take care of that before I sent these. Um, I'd take some extra precautions so nothing like that would manifest during shipping. I'm just curious if that was successful or not, or 
if you had the same issue. Um, if you did, hopefully it'll clear up in a couple days like Fish Boys did. Let me know. Michael Wentworth, you caught me busted. Signed into the wrong YouTube account. No. <laughs> Hope all is well. It's 85 and sunny on the sandy shores of Guam today. I was wondering if you'd made it to Guam yet. Um, I didn't say the location because I didn't know if you'd want folks to know. But yeah, watch out for brown tree snakes, man. Just one more fish with Josh. Sent a canister of rapashi to a customer 60 miles away. Sat in the town he lives in for six days. I have shut down shipping till the new year. St. Louis is a package eating monster. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, if you're shipping, if you're shipping USPS priority or express, if you're shipping USPS at all, I wouldn't ship anything live via USPS until well after the new year, for sure. UPS and FedEx are still doing fine as far as at least next day delivery goes. So um, I will, let's see here, today is the 9th. So the last day I will ship for this year is going to be next week, the 14th or 15th. Um, because with the Christmas rush, I don't want to risk shipping any closer to Christmas. And then I'll pick up shipping again uh, after the new year, probably on the 5th. Actually, probably the 6th, just to give... 5th or the 6th, just to give packages... Um, a little more time to clear out of the backload from the holidays for all the the last minute shipping that is still in the system after the holiday after christmas right all right let's see here but yeah i'm with you i think that um i think it's wise to be cautious about shipping as we get closer to christmas and if you're doing usps yeah shut it down i think that's a good idea <laughs> Um, I am, I don't know when this will happen, but I'm hoping to find a way to share my shipping rates with other sellers on GetGills. So I, there's a lot of like agreements that have to happen and with, with my carriers to make sure that they're okay with that. And then there's a lot of back end stuff to just make it so that um, we have to make it so it's automated basically for that to happen. And so if we can find a way to do that, I would really like for folks that sh sell on get gills, even if they're a small seller to be able to get really good rates via UPS or FedEx because the experience is just so much better than USPS. So it's in the back of my mind. It's, it's, I don't know if it can happen for sure, and if it can, I don't know when it will happen. It's not going to be anytime soon, but that is on the back of my mind. It's something I would like to do for folks. Crown Tail Half Moon, do you recommend using Epsom salts for thinning guppies? If yes, what dosage and treatment period? So I don't think I would use Epsom salt for a guppy that is thin, if I'm understanding the question correctly. I don't think it's going to like clear out parasites and stuff. You could try it. It's not going to hurt him at all. Um, the thing I would use Epsom salt for is for a fish that's constipated or something like that. Uh, it's just like in humans, right? It's uh, <laughs> That could solve the problem. <laughs> don't take too much. <laughs> um, but I don't know about using it for guppies that are thin in order to clear parasites, if that's the question, if I understood that correctly. That being said, I'm not a veterinarian and I don't have a ton of experience using Epsom salt. Mirik Tomshik didn't highlight, but I saw it anyway. Hi, Dan hashed a few batches of Trilineatus and Aeneas Cori's recently, but they never seem to take food and die three to four days post hatch. Tried baby brine shrimp, rapashi, wetted dry food advice. Let's see. Okay, a couple things. Three to four days post hatch. So, are you waiting until they're free swimming before you feed them? Because they'll hatch and they'll have this big yolk sac they feed off for several days. And um, so, if you're feeding 
before that yolk sac's gone and they're kind of free swimming searching for food, that could be a problem because that food will just be rotting. They won't be eating it or not eating much of it, especially at the beginning there. If that's not the case, if they have absorbed their yolk sac and they're hunting for food and then you're feeding, is it an issue if you've never seen the bellies nice and full of food? Um, if that's the case, that's surprising to me because I've never had a baby Cory that was ready to eat and had access to live food, you say baby brine shrimp, and wouldn't eat. Um, so I guess the question is this, are they just not eating at all, which is strange, they will eat baby brine shrimp. Something that could help is if you refrigerate your baby brine shrimp before you feed it, that will make the baby brine shrimp really sluggish. So when you feed them to the quarries, they'll sink to the bottom where the quarries are instead of being up in the water column where they won't get to them. But usually enough of them are on the bottom at any given time that they'll get eaten even if they aren't refrigerated. But that's one thing I guess I could think of that could help get the food down where the quarries are. But it could also be pollution. I mean, water fouls so quickly that it might be an issue of the water um, getting polluted from food that isn't being eaten rather than the quarries not eating. So that's, that's the question. Is it that they're not eating or that the water is getting fouled with excess food or that they're eating and the water is getting fouled, you know, any of those issues. So those are my thoughts on that without being there and like seeing your setup and, and actually observing the fish and being present. I don't know how much I could tell you about that, but um, the trick is feeding enough food and keeping the water clean. But baby brine shrimp really should work. You might want to try micro worms. Those sink to the bottom and baby catfish love them so um maybe try microworms and uh yeah those are my thoughts maria z i found about a dozen half inch baby panda quarries today from the first bunch i ordered from you awesome maria z i am glad to hear you got babies cheers cigars all around <laughs> and half inch that's a good size. Those are out of the danger zone. Those should come up without any problems. I haven't said hi to my mods today. Hey, mods, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for showing up and doing what you do. Xander, don't mess around, man. Don't make candy delete you. Igor Anonymous, my filter died four days ago. The new one will be here tomorrow. How long will the beneficial bacteria live in the canister filter? Will I have to start over? Thanks. Did I s Thanks, Edgar. Igor Anonymous is Edgar. <laughs> Hang on, the filter kicked, uh, the uh, furnace kicked on. I gotta go turn it off because it's too loud. Just a second. That's how you know it's live, folks. Yeah, it's, it's literally the furnace is like 10 feet from me. It, it's super loud when it kicks on. Igor Anonymous. So let's see here. Yeah, so beneficial bacteria needs a good supply of oxygen. And if you have a canister filter and there's not a constant flow through it, I don't think your population of beneficial bacteria is going to be doing very well in there. So you're going to have plenty of beneficial bacteria, though, still in your aquarium. I'm imagining you have an air stone in your aquarium or um, some kind of redundancy. Um, if you don't, that could be a little rougher. But on the surfaces in your aquarium, there should be beneficial bacteria. So I wouldn't count on the canister filter because it's kind of closed off without water flowing through it constantly, it goes, you know, the, the oxygen that's left in it gets absorbed really quickly, and then your nitrifying bacteria will die off without fresh oxygen. They need a constant supply of it. So I wouldn't be like, I have to start over completely, but I put your new filter on, understand there's already beneficial bacteria in your aquarium, especially 
if there's some kind of redundant thing, even just an air stone somewhere in the tank that's keeping stuff from getting stagnant. And But even if you don't, there'll still be some somewhere. So I would put the new filter system in place and just maybe not feed for a couple days after you get the new filter system. Um, or not now either like I wouldn't feed for a couple I wouldn't feed till the filter system comes and has been running for a couple days and then I just feed very lightly for about a week or two until that filters enough beneficial bacteria is moved from the aquarium into the canister filter for it to be kind of up and running and um, I would definitely get an ammonia and nitrite test kit if you don't already have one so you can keep tabs on that and if you see a problem you know to change some water but keep uh, keep the food very light for a while until things kind of catch back up. That's how I would handle that. Orange cones, you need a photographer. I know. Um, I'm going to be putting out a call. Um, we are looking to hire some folks, and one of those people is a content creator. Basically, I'm looking for like a Jimmy. Um, and... I don't want to talk about it a ton tonight because I have to write the job description and get everything clear, but that is someone who will be one of the four of the kind of founding team to start the warehouse with me. Um, someone to help create content so that we don't get in this situation permanently. <laughs> Pudgy Paints, if you have a question for Dan, please remember to type at Dan's fish so he sees it, right? If you do that, it'll be this bright, nice orange at Dan's fish and I'll see it. So thanks, Punchy Paints, for Reminding folks. How are we doing? 7.53. We've still got, we got time. Okay. W. Marion. Ah, uh, well, we can wait until next time. Hoping all the fish settle in as well. Oh, okay. I think, I think W. Marion is saying... Uh, on the rice fish, uh, don't know yet, need a couple days to see. Cool. Well, I hope they do well. Let me know. They should. I, uh, I did another round just to try to clear anything they might have before I sent them. Xanadu do. <laughs> Looking at, let's see here. I already did that one. Did chat jump on me? Oh, yeah, I did. That's why. Hey, Aquatasy, good to see you. I am scrolling here to try to find. Stuff jumped like crazy. Woo! Hang on. Wow. Like, okay. Folks, the I'm I've scrolled up as high as I can. Like, oh, that's it. It won't let me go any higher. So Xanadudu's super chat is here. Um and I cannot see anything above that. So if you add a question or comment above that and I haven't answered it yet, please repost it because uh, I won't be able to see it unless you do. So, oh, you sent me a $5 super chat, Xanadudu. Thank you so much. Kevin's Aquatics throwing down $5 with a speedy hippo. <laughs> that is an awesome little sticker. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate you. And Richard Volman, $5. Hey, thanks for the money, guys. Always appreciated, never required, but it does make my wife super happy. Love Golden Zebra Loaches I purchased from you. They're doing great. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Good, good. Yeah, so the Botia Loaches, I think, are just so underrated. Let me see if... Um, so this is the one we're referring to. Great little fish. The botillas are neat. So they start off with like this pattern, right? And then as they grow and mature, they turn into something more like this. And they're both cool. Like this is so cool to look at. So they're never, this is kind of a transition stage, I would say right here. So they're never boring. They're peaceful. The, the genus Botia is peaceful. This is not. Okay. We should talk about this. If it's actually the genus Botia, it's a nice peaceful fish. Should be fine with a community aquarium. This is a tiger loach. This is not the current name. It's not Botia. This is an air. 
These guys are aggressive little jerks. I love them, and they do great with things like tiger barbs and other fast-moving fish. But I want to make it clear that make sure that whatever fish you're getting is actually named Botia. <laughs> That's not correct. <laughs> but the actual Botia loaches are fantastic. Nice, peaceful community fish. Don't get too big. Check it out, those. You know, some, some don't get over two inches. Some can get five inches or so. Um, but peaceful, gregarious. They clown around. They're tons of fun to watch. They're easy to feed. Um, I really like them too. So, Richard, I'm glad to hear yours are doing well. Rockford Fishkeeping. Hey, good to hear from you, Rockford. I hope you're doing good. Some shippers don't even follow their own policies. USPS is really bad at false advertising. Yeah. I, I'm hoping USPS kind of gets its act together. It used to be such a reliable, delightful service. Um, and I don't know what's going on, but it's... And it's not just this year with COVID. It's been... For a while, it's been... Things just don't arrive when they are advertised to arrive. It's, it's been frustrating. Hence FedEx and UPS. That's why I switched. Crown Tail Half Moon, when shipping bettas, do you need to add pure oxygen or just trap ambient air will be adequate? Either one is fine. Either one. Um, for the last several years, I've shipped with pure oxygen with bettas. Um, yes, even betta splendens. I know there's all kinds of lore out on the internet that that's harmful or something. It's not. Um, and for decades before that, I shipped bettas with just atmospheric air. They did fine both ways. Same with quarries, all those things. So I ship every fish now with pure oxygen, despite what you're going to read on the internet. Um, I've never had a problem with that. But bettas will do fine either or, whichever works for you. Peter Gill, I line my box with trash bag liner and then ship fish in breather bag with some puffy packing to ensure there's plenty of air still in the box. Now, Peter, that is a good idea. So what Peter does is he puts his... Okay, so you got a pack within a pack. So you put your breather bags in there. Then you put some kind of oxygen transferring type material around it to make sure there's a bubble of air around that. And then you seal that up. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, that would work. Um, you wouldn't save the space, though, that you normally would with a breather bag because instead of just having extra air in each individual bag, now you just have it in, in, a, lar in a larger bag around them. So it doesn't save space, but that makes sense to me. That seems to be a way that you could use breather bags, be in compliance, and it could work. Yeah, good idea, Peter. Thanks for sharing that. Petsotics slash multiple aquariums. Policy or not, it's common sense and logical to double bag fish when shipping. Yes, I know not everyone <laughs> poses those traits. I think you're saying possesses those traits. Yeah, I mean, the last thing you want to do is not have redundancy when you're shipping a live animal. Um, let's respect the animal enough to, to make it so if there's a leak, they still survive because there's redundancy there with a the second bag. Orange cones, what if I send you a cooler to fill with? Say 100 chili raspberries. Think of all the plastic you would save. <laughs> now, if you were to like come over here and bring your cooler, I'd be happy to fill it with chili raspberries. Mailing a cooler, though, yeah, that gets a little dicey. Thank you, uh, Candy, for posting Select Aquatics there for whoever was asking about um, native libraries. All right, Rockford Fishkeeping, I wouldn't ship anything not alive through USPS either. Uh, I think you mean I wouldn't ship anything alive through USPS. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, it's been rough, yeah. W. Marion, I did see Fish Boy's video. I saw no signs of fungus or white stuff on the Matana rice fish I received yet. Oh, okay, good. Then I don't think you're going to have a problem because with Fish Boy, it was right in the in the bag before he opened them. So I think we got it. So uh, just another round of uh, Ick X and Prozzi is all. So now, for those that don't know, they 
the ones I sent to Fishboy didn't have any signs anything was wrong. They had been through Ickex and Prozzi and other stuff. Um, so I thought they were fine. But when I shipped them, the stress of shipping brought something out. And uh, when they got to him, you could see in the bag that something was going on. Luckily, they cleared up within just a couple days. So it wasn't a major, major thing. But it was scary, especially with a super rare fish like that. So um, it's not like I purposely sent <laughs> Fish Boy something that I knew had an issue. I would never do that. But it uh, looked like they needed one more round. So... Glad to hear it worked. Aquatici, those are terrific looking fish behind you. Just had to say that. Hey, thanks for saying that. Yep. I, I love the archer fish. In fact, they're super hungry. I, I didn't feed them yet today because I fed mostly algae wafers and baby brine shrimp today. And those being surface eaters, I have to get them their fiber bites. But I'm glad you like them. And... I'm loving those, uh, the Roseline Sharks, the Golden Roseline Sharks, man. Those are awesome. I did try to get more in for folks, this import, but the breeder was out. So hopefully next time I can bring more in. Rockford Fishkeeping, will bristlenose plecos eat angelfish eggs? Oh, absolutely. For some reason, nothing has changed with water, but I don't get eggs over 24 hours and they disappear. Yeah, so as soon as the lights go off, um, those bristlenose will eat those eggs. Yes, it, it will be delightful caviar for them. It's hard for angelfish to defend against plecos, especially at nighttime. They'll do a pretty good job when it's, you know, nice and bright, but once the darkness hits, I, I think they're they're outgunned at that point. Aquatici, what's your favorite egg layer to breed? Not necessarily the easiest, but the most fun and rewarding for you. For me, it's killifish, all kinds of killifish. I love them all. Annuals, non-annuals, semi-annuals. Um, my favorite fish of all time is Fundalopantax garden rye. So your basic garden rye killifish. It's the one that kind of started the whole thing for me, and just out of nostalgia, I've kept them since I was a kid. I really like those, but killifish are my favorite. There's so many varieties, there's so many uh, reproductive strategies within the family, and or order, or whatever, whichever class that is. <laughs> class, phylum, I don't know. Um, and um, there's so many colors and patterns and stuff, and a lot of them, when the eggs hatch, they're big enough to eat baby brine shrimp right away, which makes them super easy to raise. So I really like them. Orange cones, the mods are being mean to us. I'm, I'm sure you deserved it. It's like my kid complaining the teacher's mean. I'm like, yeah, what'd you do? <laughs> okay. Hey, we have 230 folks here. That's pretty good. Let's go ahead and do the giveaway now. That way, the, the latecomers that come in the last five minutes just to just to see if they can win something and freeload won't have a chance. Let's do this. Let's stick it to the latecomers. So we're going to go ahead and do the giveaway. This is for six lemon tetras. And the winner is Mike's Aquatics and Things. Subscribe since April 23rd. Hey, Glad you're here, Mike. Thanks for being a subscriber. I appreciate it. If you would respond within the next minute or so, let us know you're here. Um, then I will send you these on Monday or Tuesday next week. I'll send you a box of six lemon tetras, all free. You don't have to pay shipping or do anything. Just email me your first name, last name, and mailing address, and I'll put them in a box and send them to you. So let's hope that Mike's Aquatics and Things are here. <clears throat> Let's see here. Oh, yes, you are. OMG, no way. Yes way. So congrats. Congrats, Mike's Aquatics and Things. You are the winner. It's it's so funny when people actually win. It's like, oh, it's real. <laughs> and then they actually get the fish. It's like, oh, this happened. <laughs> it's so much fun. I love doing this. Um, so send me an email, dan at dansfish.com. First and last name with your email address, like or with your mailing address, like I mentioned, and I'll just send those to you. All right, chat jumped big time. Let me get up here and find where we are. 
There we go. Peeps Lost Sheep. <laughs> One of the best usernames ever. Have you considered selling scuds, even just small batches of 10 to 20? I have. I've thought about it. The issue is I've got like 100 pea puffers right now. And I just brought in a bunch of rare wild gobies. And I want to bring in some pipe fish and things. So, so I've bet on the side of caution. Basically, I have to be 100% sure that the fish I'm bringing in will have enough scuds to eat. I can't like take a risk that I can't take care of the fish I bring in, right? Um, so I need to make sure before I can sell any. And puffers can go through a ton of scuds. <laughs> so can like fish that are wild and haven't yet settled in. I, I want food they recognize and go for right away. And so scuds are a part of that arsenal. Now that being said, the pea puffers I have They'll eat frozen food and stuff as well at this time, but um, but I'm planning on bringing in some pipe fish, and pipe fish are going to need scuds. Baby brian shrimp isn't going to cut it, and I don't have Daphnia, so I just uh, I'm just not comfortable doing that at this moment. Now I'll tell you who will sell you scuds is HC Aqua. So HC Aqua, if you're here and if you do have some scuds available. Would you let us know or anyone else that might have some available for sale so Peeps Lost Sheep can get some? And yeah, 10 to 20 is all you need to start off. Orange cones, if you keep plants, a filter crash is not so bad. That's true. Yep. Planted uh, tanks can survive a lot of issues. Plants are a nice redundancy for a lot of things. Now, it's not bulletproof, but it can certainly help. Mile High, what is the first fish you ever bred? Um, the first, I don't remember the first one I ever bred because I had a few guppies or sore tails or something, but the first one I remember breeding and bred on purpose and was super, ex well, I was excited when the guppies and sore tails had babies too, but the first one that really, really got me was Fundalopanchak's Garden Rice. So that's why that's my first and favorite. That's why my, my <laughs> Okay, that's why that's my favorite. It was my first egg layer. Crown tail, half moon. Is it necessary to use UV in line with canisters? Nope, I never have. Most people haven't. That's a fairly new thing. And um, depending on the system, it can be more of a gimmick than an actual thing that works. So if you are interested in UV, do some re research. Make sure you're getting enough wattage to actually do the job, make sure the placement is correct, and, and all that. So it's wattage per flow rate, and flow rate depends on the amount of gallons in your aquarium. So a lot of times that can be gimmicky and such a small little thing it doesn't even work. So yeah, I would just do some research, make sure you're sized right for it to be functional. And the reason I think that's important is I don't want people to not all UV bulbs are created equal. And if you don't have one that's up to the task and do the maintenance necessary for it to continue being um, effective, you're gonna be thinking you have this thing that's helping when it isn't. And so you might um, think, oh, I can do this now. I can add 10 more fish because I now have a UV filter and you can't, or I don't know. It, it, things like that. So I don't want people to get a false sense of security. Um, that takes some real research to figure out the correct sizing of a UV unit. Michael Wentworth, I know you don't offer up many of the harder water type fish due to your soft water source out there. <laughs> so jealous, yep. When you expand, do you plan to mineralize and offer harder water species? Yes. The water I'll be drawing, I just, let me show you. I think I can, let me see if I can bring this up real quick, then I'll share it with you. Um, so I got it tested this summer and I got it tested again, like got the results today because I wanted to make sure that um, I know my water really well. And once the building's up, we'll test it once a month for the first while. Let me see if I can find this and share it with you. Here it is. So this is the test that I got in today, if it will load. Why is that not loading? That should have loaded by now. 
Okay, come on. I just want you to open. Why won't you do that? Okay, bear with me for one second. This has been weird. <laughs> okay, it wants me to download it. I didn't have to do that last time. Okay, here you go. Here's the water in the creek as of today. I turned this sample in, oh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, got it back today. So pH was 8.4. Alkalinity, 277. Hardness, as of calcium, pretty much, 300, basically. So it's actually kind of hard alkaline water out there at the creek, um, at least right now. And that's how it was this summer, too. I'll do another test once the rain really starts and see how soft it is at that point. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely be bringing in um, harder water fish because I'll have harder water. And I'll also have my current water source as well out there. So I'll have soft water and hard water. So it should be a nice mix. So I don't think I'll need to mineralize if I'm drawing from uh, that river because it's fairly hard. At least it has been the last couple tests. And those are tests done at a professional laboratory. I'm confident in the results. Um, Rock and Fish. Did you hear Global Fish Company in New Jersey, I think, got in a Nigeria order last week? No, I did not hear that. I'm going to have to... Now I'm excited. <laughs> I did hear back from my vendor or one of my sources in Nigeria a couple days ago, and he said that he was in discussions with... Um, I don't know what the name of the thing is on their side. Basically with the commerce agent there trying to finalize the shipment. Um, it wasn't finalized yet last I heard, but hopefully within the next week or two, we could get that in. Of course, right when I landed another import is when that would happen. <laughs> but no, let me, let me check on that. I did not hear about that, Dave, um, but that makes me excited. I wonder which airline he used. We're trying to do it through Delta. I wonder if there's someone else um, that can do it quicker. Aquatacy, what's your favorite egg layer? Already got that one. Rockford Fish Keeping, nope. What I meant is I wouldn't use USPS for anything anymore, live or not alive. Oh, not for anything, period. Gotcha, gotcha. Orange Cone, sad to see misinformation given by some big box stores. Saw Common Pleco as needing 15 gallons. Oh my gosh, of water. Not for long, sheesh, yeah. This gets my goat. And the fact that... Uh, and the fact that the industry supports that, like super large farms, uh, like the Florida farms, some of them do millions of units of common plecos every year. Like literally, several million, many millions are sold every year and they do it because it's easy money and it's uh, it's easy for them to do and there's a market for it and unfortunately because of that it keeps getting the industry just keeps driving that item because it's so profitable and so easy Ugh. yep yeah I don't know what to say about that it's just I think it's going to take a sea change of people not buying them anymore. It's going to take people speaking out and writing in to suppliers and stores and farms and saying, hey, stop doing this and putting pressure on them. Um, but what it's really going to take is just the market drying up for them. So maybe it's educating people that there's a better option called bristle nose plecos or clown plecos or rubber nose plecos or whatever. Um, rubber lip plecos but th th that's a long hard fight though they're so entrenched and they make so much money for the industry that the industry's incentive right now is all about moving them even though it's not the ethical thing to do yeah it kind of breaks my heart 15 gallons jeez so i'm thinking five dollars i'm a hobbyist but i'm currently raising 1,000 rainbow fish Woo wheeze how can I not feel guilty selling these things? The last thing I want is to hurt the pros. Oh, I, no, sell them. Why not? Go ahead. 
if you want to sell them like if you want to sell big batches send me an email let me know what you have and how much you're asking um, I'd be interested in buying a hundred or two from you depending on what kind they are if it's multiple kinds I sell a lot of rainbow fish too I'd buy them from you in bulk but if you don't want to sell them in bulk don't feel guilty man you bred them it's your right to sell them I hope they do well for you I hope you sell tons of them um, getgills.com is where I sell mine you're welcome to join sell yours there no problem see I think it's I think it's an entrenched old-fashioned idea about competition I honestly do I look at things like this as synergy instead if you sell high quality fish what you're doing is making it so that people that buy your fish have success with them which means they're gonna stay in the hobby and they're gonna buy more fish for years and years and years as opposed to just selling a fish that isn't healthy and not gonna do well and drives people out of the hobby so I welcome with open arms anyone who is selling fish in such a way that people are gonna be successful with their fish because the more people that stay in the hobby because they're successful the larger the entire industry gets and the the pie grows for all of us um, you know that whole thing rising tide lifts all boats I'm good with that like the only time I want someone to get out and stop selling is if they're doing a poor job that people don't that their customers don't have success with because that drives those customers out of the hobby and that hurts me long term that hurts everyone long term because then our market shrinks what I want is everyone to sell quality fish so people have success and the entire market grows um, there's plenty of market share for everyone if that's the case so come on in sell your stuff do it right do a good job take care of your customers help them be successful and let's grow this thing it's not a problem don't feel guilty you're part of the solution man I hope I mean <laughs> I haven't seen your fish and I don't know what your shipping methods are but if you're doing it right come on in all right orange cones don't make us report you to the ASPCA for starving the archer fish oh yeah they're anything but starving they put on so much size they're yeah they're greedy little pigs is what it is just one more fish with Josh working on my first attempt at breeding bettas I have two beautiful galaxy betta and the male is just build a bubble nest hashtag bip awesome I don't know what bip is oh breeding is pleasure ha <laughs> Amen. Um, congratulations. I hope they go well for you. And the key is small life foods, rotifers, infusoria, paramecium, stuff like that for the first couple weeks. Then switch them to the baby brine shrimp. I swear with baby bettas, that's the entire thing. Small life foods to start with. In clean water, of course, as always. But that's the trick. They're just not gonna do well if you feed only baby brine shrimp right away they need that first week or so with smaller stuff you'll get a few to live maybe but if you want a nice big batch that grows to their full size and stuff start with something smaller bunny viper <laughs> reminds me of a scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail hi Dan my mom hates the shape of rainbow fish do the dwarf neon rainbows grow that way also thank you so much yeah I would say so um, maybe to less of an extent but a full-grown male dwarf neon rainbow um, neon okay let's let's see if there's any pictures there Prey Cox once they get really big then they do get a little funkier shape let's see if I can find a picture of a really old one maybe not to the same extent but I'm not seeing a picture of a really really old one the biggest ones I okay here we go so this is start is this is the shape I think you're talking about so this the fish kind of there's a little bump there but not much it's kind of like the fish's head matches its body right and then there's this one where the fish's head no longer matches its body oh wait I'm not even showing this sorry <laughs> apologize I'm real bad at my job here so this is like what most people see when they see a neon dwarf rainbow fish right 
the, the head and the body are proportionate. What happens with rainbow fish as they get older is this, where the head and the body are disproportionate because the body kind of humps up so much and becomes more circular. This is the look I think you're talking about that your mom hates. So even with neon dwarf rainbows, it does happen. Maybe not to such a stark extent as some of the other larger Melanotania species, but yes, it, it will happen. Now, they're not really rainbow fish, but blue eyes don't do that. So the pseudomugils and, and melis and things like that, those might be an option if you like that kind of fish, that family of fish, that group of fish, but don't, uh, don't want the big disproportionate body to the little head sticking out thing. <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, it is a little different looking, but I think they're beautiful. Sorry, guys. I'm... I'm not looking at the camera because I'm scrolling. There we go. Chat jumped on me. So, mainly Betas slash Keith. Another great stream, Dan. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome. And we have 189 here. Yeah, people did drop off after the giveaway a bit, didn't they? Raphael Swit. Hey, Dan. Ever breed, breed lamb chop rasbors? I have not. I'd like to get mine to spawn and looking for recommendations on how to get them in the mood and later what would be the best food to tr for fry. Thanks. Um, so, Raphael, I have not. I would refer you to uh, Mark's Aquatics. I don't know if he has a video on them or not, but the videos he has on the different tetras and rasboras and things that he has bred are detailed. They take you through the whole process, and the same principles will apply. The difference is Harlequin lamb chop rasboras tend to lay their eggs, I believe, on the underside of leaves and not just like scatter them in moss. But as far as taking care of the babies and the types of food and conditioning the breeders and all that, all that's the same. So I'd refer you to um, Mark's Aquatics. Has great videos on breeding small egg layers like that. Aquatici, I think it's so cool that you do these giveaways. That's a great thing for you do for the fish fam here on YouTube. I'm, I'm glad you like it. I think it's fun. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my voice gave out. Yeah, I think it's a fun thing to do, too. I have a blast doing it. Um, it wasn't my idea. My, my friend Pistol, who helps me bag fish, um, he was he's a, a big wig on a major saltwater group for corals. He's a big coral head. And um, some folks there did a thing like that, and it was a ton of fun there. And so he's the one that suggested it. I tried it and I was like, hey, that was fun. And I've been doing it ever since. By the way, this is our 149th live stream. So one a week for 149 streams. We've been doing this for a while. <laughs> Goyo V, gotta go. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for coming here. Ground Tail Half Moon, thank you so much for answering questions. Oh, happy to do it. That's my job. The, the two big things I'm trying to solve for are getting healthy fish to customers and, and trying to educate so customers are successful with healthy fish. Those are the two things. So the, the processes and procedures we use to take care of fish and prep them for shipping and ship them and everything, that's the first part. And the second part is education. Luckily, there's lots of good folks doing education, um, so I'm, I'm not just on my own trying to fix that, right? So, um, but happy to answer questions. That's what I'm here for. My hope is that by doing this, I can help future customers and other folks into fish be more successful with fish and grow the fish industry bigger. That's good for all of us. Michael Wentworth, in the spring, I'll be in the market for some nice Cyprochromis and some feather fins. Oh, cool, cool, cool. What is the Nasuda? I don't know. I don't know my feather fins and stuff enough to know which one that is. Oh, okay. Yep. The, the one I know, I think, is, is it Fursidens or something like that? So these guys, yeah. That's pretty with the egg tips down on the ventrals instead of on the anal fin. Yeah. I like those too quite a lot. The first time I ever saw those was in John Neiman's fish room out in Simi Valley, California. 
Um, he has a fish house just full of big tanks. He's got a big thousand gallon aquarium as well in his living room, which I think Blue Zoo did a video of. And he had this big, I don't know what it was, 240 gallon or something like that, with a breeding male and several females in there. And the male had built the big old volcano sand dome and everything and was all flared up. Whew. Man, some of those African cichlids, especially those Tanganyikans, man, they're, they're so unique. Tanganyika when stuff evolved there and just went poof, went a different path than Malawi and Victoria, it just, it's so neat, the fish from there. Alrighty. Steve Ehrlich. Hey, Steve, good to see you. There's a reason that there have been delays with USPS. It's easy to find out with a simple search. Simply bashing them is an ignorant thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, but... If they are supposed to provide a service in a, in, a, in a time frame and they don't, then I don't know if the, if the reason matters. The fact is they're not fulfilling their obligations, so you got to go somewhere else. So, yeah. But I've been accused of being ignorant many times, and usually it's true. <laughs> I don't claim a lack of ignorance. Uh, Kevin Long, planning on breeding clown quarries, plecos, and autos in a 40 breeder in rotation and move the adults to the community tank and fry to a 10 gallon tank with shrimp. Suggestions. Okay. Clown quarries, plecos, and autos, all in a 40. And moving the adults out. Okay. Yeah. I think that sounds like a good plan. Sounds like you have enough tanks. You could get some batches and and have somewhere to raise the the fry. Sure, I don't see any problem with that. The I guess the the only thing that I could see there that could possibly be an issue is if if the plecos you're getting or some of the monsters or something um, are are big enough to damage quarries or autos. But if you're doing smaller plecos, I think you'd probably be okay. Have I ever kept autos and plecos together, like bushies and autos? I'm trying to think. I think I have, and I don't think that was an issue. I think it might work. Orange cones, how many paku can I keep with my guppies in a 20 long? <laughs> All right. <laughs> we can count on orange cones. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Orange Cones. <laughs> Keeping us from getting too serious around here. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, mainly bet is Keith. Is it normal for golden zebra loaches and yo-yo loaches to play dead? Oh, yeah. I find them laying on their sides, thinking they are dying, and then they're up and swimming, and fine. Happens off. Yeah, that's what loaches do. They're just little clowns. Absolutely. They, loaches are loachy. Yep. They'll lay on their side. They'll, yeah, no problem. Bunny Viper, thank you so much. You are so kind and go above and beyond to help us all. I'll be shopping with you sometime soon. I trust you and believe in your integrity. I just do faithful follower. Well, hey, that's a nice comment to read. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Bunny Viper, appreciate it. All right, I think, oh, we got one more maybe. S. Shrestha. Do you sell Synodonis catfish? I don't. My LFS doesn't. Also, that was Mabuna. Yeah. How do you get rid of diatoms getting crazy out of hand? Thank you for helping people like us educating. Great job. Okay, so diatoms, if you're talking about that brown algae on the glass, that's going to go away. That's, that's something that tanks go through. Usually that indicates that your tank is fairly new and not fully mature yet. So you can get, like Bushinos plecos will eat that. Um, Auto sinkless will eat that. Uh, auto sinkless aren't going to do okay with Mabuna, of course, but um, some of your plecos will take care of that. However, if you have a tank full of Mabuna and you have diatoms, I would just scrub it by hand and just realize that's part of a tank coming into maturity. So I, I don't think that's going to be an issue long term. That's something we almost, I wouldn't say always, but frequently see in a new tank as it's settling in. It's just a good sign that the tank is maturing and moving on. That's what I'd say about that. Okay, we are out of time. So I would like to 
thank everybody for being here, especially my moderators. Couldn't do without you. Everyone that left a super chat, thanks for the money. Always appreciated. Never required, but it does help. Everyone that left a question or comment, thank you. Um, and I think, let's see here, is, is Punchy Paints going next? Let's see. If she is, I want to plug that real quick. And um, just take a minute here to see. Well, it'll pop up before I'm done. So if Punchy Paints is going next, head on over. You'll get some good fish stories and be able to geek out on fish some more. Um, we'll be back 7 p.m. Mountain Time next Wednesday. Until then, have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.